thank everybody for joining as part of a Work Unleashed series. Today, uh, like Ian said, we're speaking to Mike Engels so, uh, from Sierra Oncology. Welcome, Mike. Thanks, Manu. Happy to be here. Yeah. So, uh, so Mike, we've been talking to a lot of uh, uh, some of our biotech customers, having several conversations this year. So we're happy to you know, have the same conversation you know, with you and you know, see how things are going for yourself, your company, as well as your industry as well. So maybe you can quickly start us off by talk to us, uh, start us off by telling us a little bit about uh, Sierra Oncology, uh, you, yeah. know, uh, you know, and, any, and your tenure at Sierra. Yeah, yeah, for sure. So um, first of all, thanks for, for having me on. I'm happy to chat about our experience, both broadly through, um, you know, experience with this pandemic and setting up a virtual company and, and our, uh, very fruitful and productive relationship with Box that we've had over the years that's helped us enable this. So um, Sierra Oncology is a late stage drug development company. We are actively working on uh, a phase three trial for multiple or myelofibrosis, excuse me. Um, and it's a really exciting space to be in, you know, being part of a company um, in the life sciences world that's making a difference and impact in people's lives has always been very appealing to me. I started my IT career in life sciences, sort of deviated for a few years to go get some different experiences, but really wanted to find my way back. And I was really fortunate to land with Sierra. So when I joined Sierra was uh, just about five years ago, maybe a little less, four and a half. And, um, and there was some really progressive thinking in the organization, even when I joined around um, virtuality. And so we had a couple of small physical footprints, but largely um, the leadership wanted to be able to recruit staff um, really globally. You know, we've got folks distributed all across North America and, um, and even globally, we've got one, one gentleman in Australia. And so, you know, really pushing the envelope, challenging the thinking around how we're going to set up the infrastructure, how are we going to enable this company um, to, to function? And it's been a real interesting and fun journey, um, you know, sort of shoring up systems when I first joined, how do we, you know, apply the band-aids while we're figuring out what the right strategy is to get us to, to where we can work as though we're all in the same building. It's been a really yeah. fun experience. Yeah, that, that's interesting to hear, Mike. So uh, you joined Sierra, let's say, about, about five years ago, yep. and you know, it's, a, it's a budding biotech. Yep. So like, what are some of the challenges that you think like a budding biotech faces, right? Like beyond the, some of the obvious things, like when you walk in there, you probably got to get a website up and running, get everybody email access and, yeah. and, and a laptop. But uh, you know, walking in there, like uh, what are some of the challenges that a budding biotech is facing? And as an IT leader, like, how do you see yourself supporting the business in that scenario five years ago? You know, one of the things that, or one of the, the phrases that I often use is um, business enablement. And, and my job, my team's job is to enable our broader team to do what they need to do. And we need to do it in the most effective, most efficient way that we possibly can recognizing that every dollar we spend on IS or IT is a dollar we don't spend on developing our assets, developing our drugs, putting back into that patient um, community. And so really trying to think outside the box, how can we do this? How can we deliver these services as efficiently, as effectively, and as securely? Because you know, early stage drug development, your valuation is entirely in your IP. And so how do we protect that? Those are those are the real challenges that we face. And so, you know, you, you selectively make investments. We made um, very robust investments in endpoint technology because that's what people are using to access the systems on a daily basis. But then, you know, really looking at how we can ebb and flow our cost cycle um, with, with the success or decline of, of clinical trials as they happen to go. Um, not being locked into huge capital projects, really looking at, you know, user centric um, services that that was really the mode that we wanted to get into. Uh, that makes sense. And <clears throat> so there's a this, this milestone that biotech leaders always talk about, right? It's called commercialization. Yeah. There's always a certain point when a biotech goes commercial. Uh, and it's, 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 it's a pretty big milestone because that seems to kind of affect 
uh, IT yep. uh, in a pretty broad way. So maybe you can talk a little bit about you know what that means you know in your world. Yeah, absolutely. So you know, there, there's as you know, Manu, there's many milestones, right? From um, preclinical proof of concept type milestones through phase one, phase two, phase three, and on to commercialization. And at each stage of that life cycle, um, there are sort of impetus for new systems, new processes, systems, not necessarily technology, but advancements of the company and, and challenging the thinking as you move closer to commercialization. And so, you know, as we are hopefully on the path to a successful registration trial, um, we are thinking about, okay, so what does commercialization look like? We're, you know, thinking about our medical um MSLs, medical service liaisons, coming on board to do some medical education. It's really a field team. And, you know, if we are successful in our registration, then on to sales. And, and how do we enable all of these folks that are on the road even more virtual than, than our staff that are working out of home-based businesses or home-based office, offices, excuse me. And so, you know, really challenging the thinking around this the traditional perimeter, the traditional bricks and mortar, the traditional firewall-based security and, and things of that nature. But at the same time, trying to maintain that single source of truth, that single content repository across all of your various systems that are both contributing and consuming your content, um, minimizing your management costs across all of these systems. Um, you know, these, are, these are the challenges that we face and, and that we're grappling with. Fortunately, um, you know, we're, we're largely able to start those conversations sufficiently early that we can maybe challenge some of the traditional thinking, leverage technology that is available to us today that wasn't even available to us two years ago, um, and, and really drive those efficiencies while enabling the business at the same time. Good. That, make, that totally makes sense because uh, we speak to customers all the time who are going through that phase and they're there's different schools of thought on how you handle it, right? Many times this is where M&A activity creeps in or uh, uh, commercialization activity gets outsourced. Some folks will you know, take it in-house and if you're doing it in-house, you can either use your existing platforms or just you know, go shopping. So uh, which, you know, which side of the spectrum do you find yourself in? Well, you know, or, or the, the third scenario there is a combination, right? Okay. You, you might, you might um, divest certain geographies um, that you're not going to commercialize yourself in um, while still maintaining control over other geographies. And so how do you strike that balance? Um, that's really where we're, are, you know, sort of evaluating all of those various different options as a business and trying to maintain a really flexible technology platform that should we choose to divest in a per particular geography, we can easily do the transition of the necessary content to um, that partner. Or um, at the same time, you know, as we were building out internally, how do we make sure, you know, we're integrating all of our, our sales and supply chain and, and finance related data together and, and building those in that flexible way, that integrated manner. Um, it, it, it's kind of like a puzzle, right? And you get to build build the puzzle as you're going along, which is, which is a lot of fun. Yeah. We, I, we, we love that concept. We call it best of breed. Uh, you know, many folks call it different things, but that's exactly the concept of best of breed, right? You, you buy capabilities and you, you know, you, you put the puzzle in place to kind of build out your own stack of solutions. And, and uh, just to add to that Manu, you know, I, I love that terminology and we really leverage that where we've tried to standardize on, a few core technologies. So, you know, make no bones about it. We're a Microsoft Azure shop. That is our identity provider. We are locked in with the whole suite of, of Azure security. Yeah. We're locked in with Box. Box is our, our chosen, our preferred content provider. And so to the extent possible, we are looking to integrate new systems that will either be consuming or generating content into Box. So we have that single content repository. Um, you know, we found tremendous benefit in having less friends, but better friends, um, you know, where we can really drive these relationships and develop these deep seated relationships um, to keep our infrastructure simple, um, to keep our overall management costs down, but deliver a really quality product to our end users. That's, that's excellent. Yeah, I like that less friends, but better friends. I'm going to use that. 
uh, let me take you back a little bit. So yeah, I know yeah. you guys are in late, later stage trials now, but uh, uh, you know, a lot of biotech leaders, when they first start thinking about content management and biotechnology, most of the conversations only start popping up like just well, about the time they're in phase one. That's when you know regulatory needs start coming into place. They need content management systems or they need GXP. So could you describe the situation you know, back then at Sierra, you know, leading up to that, like what, like what lit the fire that made you want to go out and get a content management platform? Yeah, acquisition. We acquired a product, um, and we were we were earlier stage development. <clears throat> so exactly as you described, where there was um, still some awareness, but maybe less urgency around all of those necessary system controls. And we found ourselves with this great commercial opportunity to acquire a later stage asset. And we had no infrastructure and to, to be able to support the um, ingress of all of that content. Mm -hmm. And so we were looking for a very quick solution um, to be able to stand up some infrastructure that wouldn't invalidate the content that came across. As you know, that, that um, chain of custody or, or the, the ongoing validated state of the content um, is really important as you're thinking about your, your submissions to the health authorities. And so we needed a repository to, to receive that. The timing worked out really, really well in that um, Box had re very recently released the GXP service offering. And so we were able to very quickly um, onboard the, the Box GXP platform, again, in a very narrow use case. We didn't displace any of our traditional SMB file shares. We didn't displace any of our VPN. It was very focused on, let's get this new product content into our possession and know that it still is, is safe and secure and controlled. Um, and we were able to do that. I, I wanna say it took us maybe six to eight weeks to stand that up in a fully validated, you know, working with uh, our implementation partner and our quality team um, to make sure that we ticked all the boxes and, and could show the right controls. And then we were able to bring the content across. And, and so it was a really, really great experience for us to be able to stand that up so quickly. Since then, we've, you know, worked very closely with Box to um, unlock some of the other potential and the value that Box can provide. And now it is our, our standard content platform. We've displaced all of our traditional file shares and, um, and we leverage Box extensively for that. Excellent. That's uh, I'm very happy to hear that. And uh, that's, that seems like, it seems to be the common journey. You know, you start off with one compelling event and there's an urgent need uh, in this case, it sounds like the driver or the compelling event for you was the acquisition, right? Yeah. So you had to support the ingress of all, a lot of these uh, regulated records that are coming in. There's, right. there's a weird, there's a weird dichotomy in the industry where, you know, you can, you, you, if you if you need to put something in into an IT system and transfer it over, then needs to be a chain of custody and validation, all of that. But I can I can put the same content into a hard drive. And drive it down the highway and bring it to you <laughs> with a lot with a with a lot more you know you know vectors for leakage, but yep. that doesn't seem to have the same level of controls. But uh, it's it's weird. It's, it's just how it is. Uh, but uh, we're we're happy that the, the former situation worked out better for you. Yeah. Uh, yeah. How uh, how important in that in that scenario is like so you mentioned GXP and yep. you need the GXP. How important is security in that, in that situation? It's you know, paramount. Yeah. It, it, it's absolutely critical. Um, you know, when we talk about security, I think about sort of three or four different aspects. There's the confidentiality aspect, meaning we don't want other people to have access to it or people that aren't authorized to access. There's the integrity, meaning that the bits and bytes that were sent are the bits and bytes that we received. And we can prove that they weren't chain, changed in in, um, in the transfer. Um, so confidentiality, integrity, and authenticity, that it is truly authentic. Um, those, those aspects of security are, are absolutely critical because in many cases, the, 
the content that we received is informing our submissions to the health authorities, the request for approval to be able to administer the drug, to be able to sell the drug eventually, so on and so forth. So being able to demonstrate those controls and that security is of utmost importance. And then, as I mentioned earlier, um, we don't sell anything, right? We're, we're not in the business of manufacturing widgets and having you know, this big inventory. Our value is entirely on our intellectual property. And so maintaining control over that IP is, is the lifeline. We, we have to do it. And the real trick, the magic, is in doing that in such a way that doesn't impede the business, right? Striking that balance. And, and we've been able to do a lot of that with Box, in happy particular Box Shield. Yeah, happy to hear that. And uh, <clears throat> there's a, in, a, a, along that same vein, there's this concept of self-service IT. Right. So uh, I remember 15, 20 years ago, you know, if you were standing up a content management system with regulated content in it, you had a lot of checks and balances, rightly so, but a lot of overhead associated with it. And the user experience in, you know, on that side was, you know, uh, normally submitting a lot of tickets, yep. going through a lot of hoops to get access, uh, training, which you still need to do, but yep. a, a lot of those things. And nowadays, uh, in some executives like yourself that I speak to are subscribing to this concept of self-service IT. That means you enable the end user, make the user experience as clean as possible, and uh, basically allow them to be flexible enough by adding guardrails as opposed to defining their path and their, you know, IS journey. So yeah, that that's been a real challenge for me personally. That that's been one of my development goals because I come from that that old school thinking where. Mm -hmm you know, part of my job is maintaining the security of the information. And my background is in computer forensics and, and security and so on. So that stuff is really, really near and dear to my heart. And so, you know, I've been really critical of changing those processes and, and really um, deliberate. What, what Box has offered us in terms of addressing that is SHIELD. And we spent a lot of time working with Shield in our test environment and with select content. Um, and for those of you that don't know, what Shield enables us to do is set an enterprise security architecture around our content, is exactly as Manu described, set these guardrails. So we can classify our content, we can, can ensure that you know, content is not shared inappropriately, but then we can get out of the way. We can, I can extract my team from the the day-to-day -day of, hey, we need to send this content to so-and-so, or we need to share this content. We can train and empower our users, enable our users, um, in our case, select users. We haven't quite got to the point where I'm comfortable opening it up uh, en masse, but at least we're getting there, um, to share with their colleagues, you know, external to Sierra, and, and have confidence that, the system is monitoring what historically would be a person monitoring. And that has been really, really empowering. And we've really started to see the adoption of that take off. Um, there's real great value in that. Yeah. But it was, it, it's been a tough, tough journey for me, my new person yeah. to get there. I'm sure, I'm sure you'll get there, Mike. This is, yeah. we'll, we'll take you along uh, with there us on that journey. Uh, could you give me an example of, you know, what, what kind of use cases are you tackling in that scenario? And just my interest is peaked. I mean, we, yeah. this is the reason why we released the Shield type of offering is to basically accelerate the type of collaboration by adding guardrails and being a little bit more hands off. Yeah. And, and, and that's exactly what we have tried to do. So um, there's, a, there's a few different scenarios. One that, that's really close to us is we have an outsourced service provider that helps us with our level one, level two support. And as simple as fundamental as sharing documentation, where before we would author a document and we might have to email it to them or, or share it some way. Now we just share out our, our help desk content repository with them. They have access to real time. They can update, we can update. Um, in our clinical operations team, we're working with several different CROs and there are various different trackers, you know, information is being updated regularly. And they came to me and said, Hey, Mike, you know, we've got this situation where 
the CRO works with a file on Monday and Tuesday, and then we work with it on Wednesday and Thursday, and then we get together and we meet and we evaluate the, the differences on Friday. I was like, why don't we just share that with them? And we can, you know, do it in, in this way. And they were like, oh my goodness, this is amazing. Yes, let's do that. And so we've seen, you know, these efficiencies and these benefits for the business um, all the while, you know, we have controls, like we can keep it within, keep the content within our ecosystem. We don't have to worry about it being downloaded or leaked. Um, we can enable or prevent editing of the content if we want it to be read only or editable. So really great granular controls, which gives us the flexibility because not every use case is the same as you know. We might want to share read only dashboards with some um, individuals or organizations, then we might want others to be edited. Um, that's where we're seeing the adoption. And, you know, it just takes a seed. And now we're starting to see, um, you know, I, I, I liken it to a push and pull. So we try and push to seed the idea. And now we're getting the pull where more and more people are hearing about it and asking for support in, in those process efficiencies. Yeah, that makes sense. Create a swell enough. Exactly. Um, enough to to have yeah. the business come to you, you know, for yeah. the value. Okay, uh, for this next section, I want to try to fast forward to today. Now you've, you've yeah. been there about five years, you've been developing the IT strategy, you've got a couple of core products in there, Box is your content platform. Now, and then, you know, fast forward to March of this year, you know, COVID yep. hits, right? And, uh, you know, companies have either uh, been just business as usual, or there's tectonic shifts in, in March. So like, did you feel like your organization was prepared for uh, the pandemic when it hit this year? Yeah, a little bit of serendipity in that um, we were built remotely. So, you know, even if we go back to when we were really reliant on VPN and, and SMB file shares and whatnot, we had architected in such a way that we could support our distributed workforce across North America. So, you know, were there opportunities for improvement, for efficiency gains, our content migration to box to be less reliant on VPN and that sort of thing? Absolutely. We've definitely made some improvements and some changes, but really, you know, I sort of joke that the biggest challenge we had when we decided to close the doors was who's going to pick up the mail. You know, that, that really truly was it. And, and so we were fortunate in that we were building this along the way and it was really, you know, there were a few folks that were primarily based out of office that we had to offer a little bit more support in getting them set up to permanently work from home. But, you know, we didn't have the tectonic shift that other organizations had to deal with. So we were really fortunate in that regard. Got it. So you were basically, uh, so, so you were kind of a remote culture already. Absolutely. And, you know, and or at least set up to be. Yeah. And basically had to make some minor tweaks. Now, you know, you know, as you go through this through the course of the year, uh, in, in in some of the conversations I've had, you know, there's in March and April there were some of these conversations. Like it could be as light as who's going to pick up the mail, like you said, but there were yeah. also a lot of VPN testing, a lot of buying laptops, a lot of that was happening as well. And then uh, fast forward to like the second half of the year, the conversations have gotten a little bit more strategic, right? Because this is clearly something that's going to stay longer. So. Uh, as you as you think through you know your your IT strategy and your plan through this year and 2021, uh, like how, how like what are some of the things that you feel like will stay? Uh, you know, like do you feel like this work from home is going to be permanent? Do you see a hybrid model? Do you feel like you need to procure any other systems to support it? Yeah, I, I think that we're going to um, probably find ourselves in a hybrid model. Um, you know, there, the thing that is missing in the work from home is the personal content video or personal contact, sorry, video is great. It is, you know, where would we be if this was happening 10 years ago and we didn't have ready access to teams or zoom or WebEx or, you know, pick your platform. Um, but there's, you, you can't replace that personal contact. Um, now that said, even if we do set up. Um, additional locations, I will be advocating that we set them up essentially as mobile hotspots. So I don't see us making significant investments in office buildouts, um, you know, in, in, in infrastructure. 
I see bringing the internet pipe in. I see setting up wireless access, maybe some collaboration rooms, but that's it. You know, it, it will be no different experience for our staff if they're working from home or if they happen to go into the office. So I see us, you know, sort of keeping that um, infrastructure consistent. In terms of systems, you know, really looking to leverage more out of what we've got, um, really leveraging the Microsoft suite. We're starting to dabble in Relay um, with Box and workflow automation. Uh, there's some use cases that we're working with various different business functions on to help streamline. Um, it, it, those sorts of things, really extracting as much value from our existing tools and then working with our commercial team um, to prepare for the commercial launch and what systems do we need to bring in. But again, all under the guise of I, I don't see us making significant investments in bricks and mortar, certainly not from my shop. Um, we will be looking to continue down the virtual path, the as a service path, if you will. Right. So like a, a lot of leveraging the platforms you already have to, to, to expand. Yeah. So, yeah. I mean, and, uh, so, I mean, how has like Box supported you in that so far? Like, I know you started with one use case and it's become a content management platform and you viewers in shield and gxp uh but like uh, how, how do you see that like extending into the commercialization phase which is the next phase and the new hybrid working phase like what are some of the benefits you see or or maybe some some, some gaps that you see that you need to fill well, you know manu we've been together uh, you know working through this journey since day one of of our box implementation and um hopefully you would echo that i've been fair but you know, very deliberate and, and maybe even to the point of being critical with some of the functionality. And Box has always been there. You know, we've always had a very healthy, open dialogue about why certain design elements that, you know, I had to wrap my head around why they were different because I come from that old architecture. Um, but you guys have also been very receptive to the feedback. And, um, you know, we've we've tried to be early adopters, embracers of the technology. I see us leveraging Shield a whole lot more um, to really enable that self-directed collaboration, get my team out of the way. I see us really leveraging Relay for a lot of the common repeatable workflows that we do on a, on a regular basis. Um, and I see us really leveraging Box as that content repository. So you know, all of the integrations that Box is working on, whether it be with Salesforce, excuse me, with various different contracts management platforms, with ERP systems to act as the content repository. Box has such a great user interface, the web interface. It's so powerful and it's so flexible and it's so intuitive that we really want to drive as much content into Box as we can because it, it's simple for our users, right? The adoption is, is really straightforward. Um, you know, I also am really excited to see what Box comes up with next. You know, there's, there's some things as we've talked about that are, you know, some challenges for us um, yeah. that, you know, we're hopefully gonna see some changes come out in, in future releases um, around flexibility, around permissioning and, cascading waterfall effect and and things of that nature um, that we'll either see some technology changes or we'll we'll figure out how to work around those together but but that's uh, I box we're invested in box box is is part of who we are and how we deliver our systems it's absolutely our chosen content repository and, and we appreciate that Mike yeah all that all that feedback you know we definitely do appreciate it. I still remember you talking to us about uh, classifications and automated classifications and we actually did release that functionality uh, uh, later this year. And uh, you know, uh, it's customers like yourself who kind of help drive that uh, kind of innovation from us. And we do, our product team does have some cool things up their sleeves for, for next year. Yeah. Um, so uh, uh, the next question is around the, uh, along the similar themes of external collaboration. Now you mentioned you're using Box for doing, you know, working with CROs. I'm sure we have other, I'm sure you have other partners. As you go into commercial phase, you're gonna have even more partners. Uh, how uh, how many would you say external partners do you work with or how important is it 
that ability to be able to still maintain that single point of truth while keeping things compliant and regulated, but still share outside because biotechs generally outsource a lot of their work, right? Yep, especially early stage and, and small biotechs. You know, we're, we're a relatively small company, but if we insourced all of our outsourcing, we'd be a pretty big company. Um, so the ability to effectively share and control that content is critical. Um, you know, we're seeing more and more use cases for that. Certainly CROs, um, as we're thinking about different business development opportunities, uh, collaborations, you know, we're setting up external, external shares for those. Um, we're seeing with our legal team, you know, sharing content back and forth with um, external counsel. It's, it's such a great platform to do this because it's all secure. We don't have to worry about leakage through email and losing control. So, um, you know, I, I, again, we've, we've seeded and there's a handful of folks that are really drawing on that functionality. Um, we're actually going to be doing a refresher training, um, sort of a reintroduction to Box now that people have been using it uh, fairly extensively for, for a number of months, um, just a tune up. And I absolutely expect that that adoption curve will continue to, to spike. Excellent. Good to hear. Uh, so, so in, in the current environment today, like, uh, most IT leaders have a few preferred toolkits. You've mentioned you have, you know, obviously if you're using Box for content management, uh, you're invested in the you invested in the Microsoft stack for Azure. Uh, what else is in your toolkit? Let's say, like if you were to go do this all over again, like you know, what would you start with to have those building blocks for a let's say a biotech in a box? Yeah, I probably those two. I would start with Microsoft and I would start with Box. Um, I would. I would go probably the whole Azure platform, um, certainly from a, an Azure Active Directory perspective, I would absolutely do that. And as content um, repository, I would stand up box and I would integrate the two for single sign-on um, and conditional access control. The other recommendation that I would make is um, I would be more aggressive in rolling out the functionality. So, um, you know, maybe set slightly higher expectations on staff, maybe not be quite as deliberate as I, I am. Um, I'm fairly conservative and, and want to make sure we've dotted all of our I's, crossed all of our T's. That's not to, see be, not to say be more cavalier, but maybe just empower staff a little bit more early on and just say, this is what we're doing, this is where we're going, um, as opposed to asking along the way. But I would those would be the two. And I think that you can cover, you know, save for finance, which of course has its own set of requirements around those tools. I think for early stage development, um, you're going to cover 90 plus percent of the use cases by having good solid authentication, the office suite of products and that box integration for content. You're going to be off to the races. Uh, that's good to hear. Uh, so, uh, you know, so so going forward in this in this stack as you're in the commercial phase, and you know, and you're growing the organization, uh, is, is do, do you see adding use cases as something that is you know going to be easy because you've invested in these in these two platforms for your toolkit, or if you'd gone a different route and let's say started purchasing you know point built solutions for for each use case that are purpose built like uh, different in philosophies, but one scales and one doesn't. Yeah, so so I'm a big proponent of simplicity. Um, I really don't like customization. I really, you know, try and steer clear of custom apps and um, very narrow use cases. I'm looking for more platform-based functionality. Um, so, uh, you know, I think with what we have in place today, the, the O365 integration with Box is tremendous. Um, the Teams integration with Box is, is coming along very nicely. That's where we spend the majority of our time. And it's only as we evolve and we start getting into these more advanced solutions, contracts management perhaps, um, QMS, RIMS, those sorts of things that we'll look to bring those in but those are later stage and 
you know, if you're working with industry leaders that are flexible and committed to customer success, you know, box bringing you on Manu and, and having a dedicated life sciences division it speaks volumes to Box's commitment to clients like us. And having that avenue to say, hey, Manu, you know, this would really be helpful. Um, and knowing that that goes somewhere. I think that our use case evolution and, and our adoption is, is going to be really straightforward and, and it's just going to continue to grow. I, I really don't see challenges. The mobile enablement is another great example. You know, um, we were clamoring, our, our team was clamoring to have access to content on their phones. We all work off of our phones extensively. Mm -hmm. um, so having that functionality, having box capture, you know, simple little tool, but scanning rece receipts, scanning documents on the fly. Those, those are the things that make all the difference to our end users and that they really appreciate. The necessary evils of the ERPs, the supply chains, the RIMs, the QMS, all that. Yeah, those are there and, and we work through them. But those little things, those yeah. are what, what resonate with the users. Yeah, and, and, that, and that, that totally makes sense, right? It's like it all goes towards the user-centric philosophy and deploying these types of systems. Like if you make the user experience better, no matter what you deploy, you automatically have better adoption. Exactly, exactly. Take a pain point away and have a friend for life, right? Yeah. So uh, just, uh, just uh, you know, just a couple of more questions and then yeah. there's a couple of questions in the queue that for sure. I'll, I'll kind of get to those. So. Uh, in, you know, given your digital first mindset right now, like what do you think has, you know, changed during the pandemic right now that you think is going to stay in the future? Like if, if 2020 didn't happen and some things would have just gone on as business as usual, right? But what's, yeah. what are some of the silver linings that you're taking out of this? Uh, to go out of that? So I think um, there's, there's a number of things. One, digital adoption. Um, I think has accelerated tremendously as a result of COVID. You know, it's an unfortunate uh, crucible to cause that. But I think that, you know, where organizations maybe had a more conservative outlook on remote work or um, digital enablement, digital enabled business transformation, hands were forced. And, you know, by and large, I think, most companies have been, or many companies at least, have been able to overcome some of those adoption challenges. And I think there's great benefit, you know, people not having to spend 10 hours a week in a vehicle commuting, they get to, if you split that time with your employer and your family, it's a win-win. Yeah. And I, I just don't see that going away. I think the reliance on bricks and mortar, that has largely been um, you know, dispelled. There, there's this recognition that we can get our jobs done. Those that can will work remotely, of course. Um, and, and it can be done effectively and, and efficiently and to a high, high level of quality. So I think that acceleration of digital transformation has, uh, is here to stay. I also think, you know, the adoption of video um, as a recognized and acceptable means of communication in business. Yes, video was available, but, you know, even though we were virtual, we rarely used video in our organization. Well, in the last six months, seven months, um, you know, nearly everybody in the company by default now has their camera on. It's okay. just the norm. And so little things like that, I think, um, are, are here to stay. I also think the profile of um, IS or IT is being enhanced because companies are reliant on the tool, the tools that we offer. And so, you know, having um, maybe a more prominent voice, maybe more input into business strategy, um, more input into remote user enablement or business enablement, I think that there's a different recognition of the value that folks like myself and, and like all of you um, bring to the table in terms of that business enablement. That's a, that's a very good point and a shift in the industry too, right? Before IT, IS was always seen as a service organization, right? That's right. Uh, about 10, 20 years ago, it was IT providing a service to yep. the internal lines of businesses. And you know, today, 
uh, more and more uh, IT organizations that are seen as kind of like in-house innovation hubs to, that are tied to the company's innovation objectives. Yeah. So, and I, I I agree with you on that front that I think some of those things are getting accelerated uh, right now, and you know IT is becoming more and more of a partner. Yeah. Repositioning as business enablement, because that's really what we are here to do is enable the business with the tools that they need. Exactly. All right. Uh, so uh, last question, like, do you have any just general words of advice for anybody just embarking on their you know, digital journey? Like think of Mike from five years ago. Yeah. Um, so it's easy for us that work in technology to think in technology terms, think in business terms. What is the business value that a particular initiative, a particular project, a particular piece of technology can bring to the business and talk to your leadership, you know, whoever is the sponsor um, in those terms. Don't talk about what the technology is going to do. Talk about what the business outcome is. That would be job number one. Job number two is always partner with the business. You know, there are a few systems that I get to make the decisions about the, the core infrastructure, the Microsoft Azure, that sort of thing. Yeah. But it's a pretty small in our technology stack partner with the business because we are here to enable the business, find out what their problems are. Don't go ask them what tool they need, ask them what their process is, what, what their outcomes or the outcomes they're looking to achieve are, and then translate that into a solution for them. That's very good words of advice. Uh, especially like that part around don't ask them what tool they want. <laughs> Never start with the tool. I have some scars from that, from those questions in the past. Um, Me too. (laughs) So, uh, all right. So I'm going to just open it up to just a couple of questions we have in the queue and and we can call it a day. Uh, So we have have a question here. Uh, I'm going backwards here. It says, follow up to Manu's question about core IT platforms that are critical to a young and small biotech. How do you see the differentiation between Fox and Office 365, SharePoint, and OneDrive platforms for content sharing and collaboration that we described this morning? Why not just use Office 365? Uh, yeah. Yeah. So first, Office 365, the back end, the content repository is based on SharePoint. And um, SharePoint is, you know, I, I sort of quip that it's a million miles wide and a million miles deep. SharePoint is incredibly powerful. Mm-hmm. But when you start thinking about how do you control that environment, it becomes very, very um, challenging. Um, Not insurmountable, absolutely lots of companies do it and kudos to them. What we found was it was much simpler for us to work with Box. There was a very clear path, a very defined timeline, six, eight weeks to a validated state. And it was a very simple interface for us to manage. All that means I get to keep my costs down. My, my team is small. I don't have to invest in my team to manage those environments. So that was largely the driver for us. The integration with the rest of O365, you know, your office suite and so on, it, it's right there. It's simple. It's default out of the box. And, you know, largely end users get a similar experience as if SharePoint was the back end. Got it. That makes sense. Uh, okay. Uh, the next question here, I'm going to kind of couple a couple of them together because they sound very similar. So, so question here, have you had any competent authority GXP inspections? How do they go and how do you handle part 11 compliance today? So these are essentially uh, related to the GXP offering that you have with Box. Yeah. So, so we haven't had any inspections yet. Um, we're, we're sort of preparing for all of those, making sure our ducks in a row. Um, how do we manage ongoing part 11 compliance? So of course you start out with your policies and your training and you know, all of those necessary evils. Um, but we also have a, a third party partner organization that works with both us, offers us a service, works with Box. Um, it's a company called USDM yep. and they offer um, uh, an ongoing validation service. So it was a, a partnership between them and Box to deliver this ongoing validation service. And so we get regular reports, they're monitoring Box's release notes and, and updates and so on and so forth. And 
it simplifies our ongoing management. We can look for exceptions now, as opposed to having to monitor what Box is offering, you know, regularly. So That's exactly right. money yeah. well spent for us. Great, good to hear that. And I'd just like to reiterate that, yeah, USDM Life Sciences is our, our validation partner for Box to support customers like yourself for exactly that benefit, right? It allows you to focus on your organization and frees you up from the, from the compliance overhead that goes with monitoring. It, yeah, and, and you know, just, just a little further plug on that, we did the cost, cost analysis. If we were gonna try and maintain the validation ourselves of our various cloud-based systems, we're looking at at least one FTE. Well, yeah. we can buy the service because USDM has scale um, for a fraction of that. It was, it was just a no brainer for us and, and it's a great service. Yeah, and I think you're I think you're being on the conservative side too, because when I ran the numbers, it was about two point seven FTEs. There you <laughs> go. Depending on how uh, how liberal or conservative you are. There you are. All right. Uh, so uh, last question, uh, and I'm going to take the question and then extrapolate it. Uh, so it says it says hi. You mentioned that you have replaced many other systems with Box. Have you replaced a TMF repository with Box? And I'm going to extend that to say, have you replaced any any other use cases like? That require learning management or you know change management and those types of use cases. So um, our TMF is largely housed with one of our CRO partner organizations, so largely outsourced. But there are certain aspects of that TMF that fall outside of their purview. And so what we did was we worked with our quality group and with our ClinOps group, and we built out. Um, the necessary folder structure within Box for the aspects of TMF that we needed to maintain. So based on the DIA model and you know all the, the regular checks and balances. Um, so that's how we've managed that aspect of TMF. Could we bring it into Box? Absolutely. Um, you know I think from a pure content management perspective, absolutely no problems with that. I think where there would be some challenges is in, you know, sort of the cross-referencing and the linking that you get from maybe a, a purpose-built TMF solution. Now, I know that Box is also working with other partners on developing that, that capability. It's not something that we've explored yet. We haven't had to. Um, in terms of other use cases, um, so yes, we have used Box for... Um, you know, a number of different use cases, less so on the sort of regulated system perspective, although um, we do use Box as our content repository. So when we talk about, um, you know, QMS or RIMS, um, while the front end isn't Box, the back end is. So our content is stored within Box. Good. That <laughs> that, that helps a lot. So thanks for clarifying that. And uh, this has been an awesome, enlightening conversation, Mike. So I wanted to thank you for uh, you know for coming here today and taking time out of your busy schedule. So thanks for joining us. Well, thank you for having me, Manu, and and always happy to help.